So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Cooper. I'm the director of the US Department of Commerce office in Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, we are joined today uh, with, by our colleagues and friends at the Indiana District Export Council. Uh, the US Department of Commerce is the frontline trade promotion agency of the United States government. We have offices in over uh, 100 offices overseas and offices in about 75 cities and states across the United States. Our objective is to assist especially small to medium sized enterprises, we call them SMEs, in their exporting efforts. Uh, to that end, we provide educational programming uh, and also uh, institutional support for uh, both companies and partners as they look at global markets. And under those auspices, we have uh, put on a number of programs with our partners at the Indiana District Export Council on exporting topics uh, that range from uh, free trade agreements uh, to export mechanics to export basics. Uh, the program that we are uh, putting on today, Women in International Trade, we have a, a great group of folks here and we appreciate you as participants for joining in. Uh, I'd like to now say, uh, thank you to all that you who have joined and many of you who have been on many of our webinars through the years. Uh, and we are uh, excited about that. And we do want to say, as we always do at the beginning, uh, please uh, mute your mics if you're not speaking like normal. And uh, we will uh, make sure to unmute those that are speakers. But I'd like to turn over the uh, microphone, as it were, to the chair of the Indiana District Export Council Commission. U.S. Department of Commerce. The chair is Andrew Renke, and I'd like to ask him to take over from here. Andrew. Mark, thank you as always. Uh, you're a great partner to the Indiana District Export Council. Uh, and, and thank you to the speakers and panelists and uh, people that are joining us today. Uh, just a little bit about us. The Indiana District Export Council is a not-for-profit organization operating under the auspices of the U.S. Department of Commerce with Mark Cooper's office. Uh, and we promote and support exporting as a way to strengthen Indiana companies, uh, grow the state's economy and create jobs. We offer one-on-one -on -one export counseling, workshops and webinars and serve as a focal point of export information and resources for companies across the state. Uh, each state has at least one. <clears throat> and as a, a, a brief plug for our, our new website, uh, indianadec.org, uh, please take a moment at, at some point and visit that because it is, uh, I think, the most comprehensive list of trade resource resources in the state. So uh, take a look at it uh, when you have a chance. Uh, DEC members are volunteer international trade professionals representing manufacturing, academic, government sectors, all appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce to assist and train uh, small, medium-sized businesses on, on how to export. Uh, joining us today uh, are a few other Indiana DEC members. Marlon Webb, new to the DEC. Uh, he's from the Indy Chamber and their Global Indy Initiative. Uh, Christine Everett, uh, IU Cyber, is joining us, also today's moderator. And Matthew Levy from Fager Drinker Law Firm here in, in Indianapolis. Thank you for your attendance. And also thank you to the collaborative partners of the DEC, the U.S. Department of Commerce, U.S. Small Business Administration. I, I see Lindsay Malachi on, on uh, our today's webinar. Uh, XM Bank, uh, Indiana Small Business Development Center, IU Cyber, and the Indy Chamber. This is our third Export Lunch and Learn program uh, webinar for 2022. Uh, these webinars are offered every other month beginning in January and ending in November. Uh, in cooperation with the Central and Indiana and uh, Northern Indiana Women's Business Centers, this webinar focuses on the opportunities and obstacles for women entering the global marketplace. Panelists will provide a personal view of their experience working in international markets. To initiate today's webinar, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for the program, Christine Everett. She is the Director of Programs and at the Institute for International Business <clears throat> which includes IU Center for International Business Education and Research, Cyber, at the Kelly School of Business in Bloomington. Christine joined the Indiana DEC last year and is an active member to our partner, uh, to our organization. And Christine, it's my pleasure to virtually turn over the podium to you. 
Thanks so much, Andy, and I am so honored to be here moderating this um, panel today and hopefully I'll live up to the challenge. Um, but first, before we kick off the panel, I want to thank two of our special sponsors and partners today, um, Emily Hawk and Leslie Hill. Um, Emily is with the Central Indiana Women's Business Center and Leslie is with the Northern Indiana Women's Business Center. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to them to say a few words before we get started. Good afternoon. Hello, I am Emily Hawk. I am the interim director of Central Indiana Women's Business Center. Uh, the Central Indiana Women's Business Center is a cooperative program in partnership with the U.S. Small Business Administration under the umbrella of Business Ownership Initiative of Indiana, which is one of the business units within Indy Chamber. So lots of partners and groups going on here, but we all live as one big happy family within Indy Chamber in partnership with the SBA. So thank you to our local SBA supporters and uh, district reps for their support. Um, BOI is also a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, and an SBA small business micro lender. So we do business loans and then we do technical assistance that is, um, for the most part, free because we're so much grant funded. So one-on-one uh, -on -one business coaching that is free. Lots of training and networking opportunities, not only with CIWBC, but our partners within BOI, which include the Hispanic Business Council and the Reentry Entrepreneurship Development Initiative. Um, I do want to take a quick moment and acknowledge and thank my colleague on the call. Marlon Webb is the Senior Director of Regional Economic Development at Indy Partnership, which is another business unit within the Indy Chamber. And from my seat and Marlon's, we want to highlight for this call especially that Indy Chamber, through a partnership with American World Trade Chamber of Commerce, offers electronically stamped certificates of origin and re export related documents. Our partnership allows companies to create, submit, and print electronically certified documents for easier and faster customs clearance and productivity gains. Interested parties can go to our website to begin the process, indychamber.com, or reach out to my colleague, Marlon Webb. Thanks so much. I'll toss it over to Leslie. Thank you so much, Emily. I'll see you here in a little bit. <laughs> Um, thank you everyone for partnering with us on this today. Um, I'm the Women's Business Center out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, the program director there. We provide services to women and individuals all across 16 counties in, in Indiana, including um, basically any counties along the 69, the I-69 corridor. Um, we do this in three ways. We provide one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching, as well as putting individuals into communities and through workshops. Um, our services are also powered by the SBA and we are thrilled to be here. Awesome, thank you so much, ladies. So now without further ado, we are going to jump into what we're all here for. So we have a, an amazing panel of three um, female entrepreneurs here from the state of Indiana who are all working in exporting. And so we have the great opportunity today to you know, pick their brains and learn from their experiences, both positive and negative. And so I'm going to give just some brief introductions and then we'll jump right into the first question. So. Our first panelist is Regina Beringer, and she's from Cummins. Um, I think everyone here in the state of Indiana has heard of Cummins, so I don't think I need to describe it anymore. And then Patricia Bowling is our second panelist, and she is with Energy Vista 2. And then our final panelist is Carol Podolak, and she is from Be Nutty. And so we also have a great distribution. So we have Regina and Cummins, um, Energy Vista is around the Fishers area, um, Indianapolis Fish Fishers, and then Carol is um, way up north in the region, 
And so we have great geographic representation too. So I'm going to start with the first question. And at any point, if any of our guests on the call have questions, please feel free to jump into the chat. You can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and enter your um, question. And then we'll make sure we feed that to the panelists. So the first question, and we'll start with Regina, um, and this is for all of you, um, which I think is more interesting than me just reading an introduction, is tell us about yourself and your company and how and why you got started in international business. Thank you very much, Christine, and uh, thank you everyone. It's just uh, an amazing group of people, a lot of people that I've not met before, which I'm, I'm happy to make this connection, so thank you for including me. My name is Regina Berenger. I'm the general manager for Cummins Global Rail and Defense Business, so I work in two different segments in our power systems business unit. I've worked for Cummins for 22 years. Um, a little bit about Cummins. We are headquartered in uh, Columbus, Indiana, and, and been around since 1919, so over 100 years old now, um, previously known as, as Cummins Engine Company. I think most people would have probably remembered that, and traditionally known for operating in the diesel engine space. <clears throat> most recently, in the past five years, we've made a lot of investments to progress and grow our business. And uh, so now we offer beyond diesel solutions, including battery, hybrid, hydrogen solutions. And um, it's just been a really exciting and great place to work. Um, about 60,000 uh, employees and operate in almost, uh, I, I believe it's around 190 countries and territories around the world. So, um, I've, as I mentioned, I've worked at Cummins 22 years, and I started in operations at a plant in Seymour, Indiana, and I have uh, worked my way through marketing and operations, uh, quality, strategy, different various roles that I've really um, enjoyed and, and learned a lot from over the years. And I would say um, the question was, uh, you know, uh, like around how did I get started, maybe an international business. I, I was working um, in my first role and I actually got to work with with customers around the world. And when we sold engines, I, I would work on the international trade documents. So, um, you know, those export certificates and things like that. That was one of my first roles within Cummins was working in that space. So um, just been a, a great role and um, ha had a lot of fun over the years and always got a lot of opportunities and have since uh, since that first role spent a substantial number of years working in global business and including in my latest role where I'm um, working in both rail and defense business that um, exports uh, heavily around the world. So um, thank you for having me. really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Regina. Patricia, how about you? Hello, everybody. I want to thank you everyone for being here and all the panelists as well. Uh, I am Patricia Bowling. I am with Energy Vista 2, a company that has helped many uh, companies in the United States to uh, do business internationally, whether it is franchising, whether it is uh, operations, whether it is investment, or whether it's simply uh, 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 sales. Uh, we also have a very unique uh, 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 point that uh, we bring to uh, our clients, which is how do you do the synergy of bringing your company not only to sell internationally, not only to do the operations internationally, but how do you understand the culture internationally? And when I talk about the culture, I'm not talking about the food and the in uh, in uh, in uh, 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 in the intricacy of uh, of uh, 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 the country itself, but the intricacies of the business culture. And at the same time, how do you do the synergy of becoming a, an international company if you bring all of the already established uh, departments within your company to also embrace the international side? So in my 40 years career of international, I, and I uh, started and initiated in Washington, D.C. and allowed me to look at uh, international policy, which gives me a great insight on what to do, how to do it, and how to understand 
each country, each region, each multilateral and bilateral agreement via V with the United States and bring that into the uh, private sector to make the uh, company successful in their international venture. Thanks so much, Patricia. And last but not least, Carol. Hi, everyone. My name is Carol Podolak, and I'm with Be Nutty Gourmet Peanut Butter. And I'm very honored and, and thankful to be here today, especially with two accomplished and experienced export women like Regina and Patricia. Um, our company is very small and very new to export. We've been in business just eight years now. It's myself and my business partner, Joy. We started selling peanut butter as a way to raise money for our local youth soccer team. We just plan to do it once a year like the Girl Scouts. We never planned to, to start a company or to start a business. And when we look back, sometimes we wonder, how did we wind up here? Um, we started once a year. People fall in love with our fun flavors like our pretzel white chocolate or toffee milk chocolate peanut butter. We started doing it a couple times a year that turned into a small manufacturing operation that just supplied local stores. Eight years later, we were distributing nationally. We were servicing stores coast to coast. We built a 28,000 square foot facility here in Portage, Indiana, but we had no plans to export. It seemed very daunting, overwhelming, and quite frankly, scary. Um, but the state of Indiana offers a great resource actually taught by Andrew Reinke called the um, Indiana Export Accelerator Program. We joined that about a year ago. Um, it was myself and another member of our sales team, Susan. We got started. We thought we'd learn a little bit about export and decide if we wanted to put our toe in the water. We didn't realize that by the time the accelerator was done, we would actually be negotiating international contracts. It's been about a year. We're just shipping out our first contracts now and our export sales are on track to pass our domestic sales by more than two times right now. We're absolutely thrilled with the way it's going. The state of Indiana offers so many resources from someone who had no idea what they were doing. They're able to come in and kind of help you through every piece of it. So we're thankful to be on this panel, um, but, but definitely feel like there's a lot to learn from people like Regina and Patricia. Wow, so Carol, since you just shared an amazing um, story, let's add on to that. And can you talk a little bit more about one of your greatest success stories so far in exporting? Yeah, so um, just the same way our small peanut butter company grew a little faster than we anticipated, so did the export sales. Um, by working with the ISBDC and working with the Export Accelerator Program and working with um, the Food Export Council, we actually started participating in some trade shows and opening up for international business. And so for the first contract we started negotiating, it was a, an international distribution company that actually encapsulates about five countries. And when we first started negotiating with them, we weren't even familiar with the terms. And so this was a huge learning curve for us. But we were thankful and, and grateful enough to get the right people on the calls with us and help us negotiate those terms. And that first contract is about a million jars of peanut butter to ship overseas. Um, and so we were over the moon with, uh, with the growth of that and we're expanding the facility, the nut house as we call it, where we make our peanut butter. We're expanding the nut house yet again um, to keep up with the sales, but it's daunting. It was very overwhelming. They start throwing out terms like X-Works and FOB and, you know, um, Court documents and and um, again, luckily Andrew and some other group, groups with the ISBDC were able to jump in and walk us through all those steps. And I think that's what really impressed us about the state of Indiana. We talked to to other food manufacturers in other states, and what they don't have is what we have right here, and that's support and help. They're kind of on their own, and they can start reaching out and asking, and someone will give them a number that maybe will get them some help. But what we have is. As Andrew said, we would get it an export team, and we sure got one, and we're very thankful for that every day. Great. Patricia, would you share your um, what you think one of your greatest success stories is in your career? Yes, thank you. I have many success stories, but I believe that one that really comes to mind, and uh, it's a great success story for the company I uh, I helped going internationally as a company that was already doing internationally. And it was, they were making uh, probably on a revenue was about $100,000 when I was able to come in and look at what they were doing and they were not growing very fast, although they had uh, a good handful of, uh, of good clients. 
and they were not making $100,000. Actually, they were losing $50,000. So when we looked at what was happening and brought in the knowledge of what they should have been doing, um, that uh, company on international alone jumped to being in two years a $15 million uh, revenue for the international sites. So that is a great, great story because not only did we evaluate, design, and then execute the, the business plan. And when you talk about a business plan, a business plan for United States is going to look completely different than a business plan for international. Uh, many companies just go out thinking that probably just sell it and they can call it international, but international entails a lot more. International entails what has been said here, uh, the shipping side, but certainly it is very important of what you're doing before you ship. What are you doing to the packaging if we're talking about retail? Uh, what are you doing uh, 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 on the legal side if you're talking franchise and operations? So it is it, the best success stories that anybody can tell is that story when you can bring the company to evaluate, design, execute, and be successful. Thank you. And Regina, what about you? Thanks, Christine. Um, I, I think I'm going to, so my my story that I'm going to share is just a little bit different, but I, you know, um, in line with women and international business. Um, so I have worked in various roles in this, in, in Cummins organization over my career, and I uh, have traveled a lot. I've been to dozens of, of countries and um, worked with a lot of suppliers and customers and partners across the world. And, you know, one of the things that I feel very, like is the one of the greatest success stories, and I feel very strongly that, you know, my company has always backed me up in, in my roles. And a lot of times, um, I, I mentioned I work in power systems, and that's big, big engine space. I mean, so think um, oil and gas, mining, uh, you know, rail defense. And oftentimes I would find myself in situations where I'm working with customers, suppliers, and partners, and um, there are just no women on their team, right? So I would go into meetings and boardrooms and oftentimes be one of the only women in the room. And oftentimes my, uh, you know, counterparts that I'm working with, um, not women. And um, I have received feedback um, over the, you know, so, so in my customer facing roles, um, received a lot of feedback through my leadership team here that, you know, that um, when I go to meetings and I um, am working with my team, there's often at least one or two women with me as well when we go meet with customers. And um, the feedback has been, wow, you know, um, from, again, from various customers, suppliers, and partners that we work with, like, gosh, you know, Cummins has really got it right. Um, they're, you know, bringing the full full force of, of this team, and they are uh, fantastic. And when we look around, we just don't have women sitting at the table working in these types of jobs, and, and why not, right? So I think it's really got folks thinking, like, we're missing out on half the workforce. Why aren't we doing a better job of recruiting women for these types of roles? And um, so... I just feel very, that makes me feel great uh, for myself, for my company, for my team. And um, I, you know, changing that mindset and uh, just, it feels really good. Um, so that's probably my story I'd like to share. Thank you. That is such a great story. Um, and it's not, we didn't even rehearse this, but it leads right into the next question that I have for you. Um, is what three things would you say are your greatest lessons learned? Is that, is, you want to start with me? Yeah, for you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Christine, happy to. Um, so uh, a lot of times um, I would say, so kind of sticking with that theme, I uh, have a lot of um, just, 
requests for informal mentoring and, you know, just talking about what's it like to work with a customer? What's it like to work in international business? And, um, you know, what are the things and how do you deal with, you know, when you show up and they're, you're the only woman in the room? And, um, you know, I just found, uh, you, you know, being very comfortable with yourself, right? Don't, don't feel that you have to be something you're not or different or, um, you know, uh, just be yourself and be comfortable with that and, um, and go with it because, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's easy to feel pressure to do something different, to look different, to, you know, um, and I would just, again, I'm just going to go back to be yourself and be comfortable with that. And, um, I have not put so much emphasis on being like the only female in the room. And I see it changing, by the way, it's changing all, all around the world. And, um, you know, when I go to different places, I uh, see so many more women and it's great um, to, to have female colleagues in the room. And um, so I would just say, you know, don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself, be comfortable with yourself. Um, and I often found myself in international business as being a, a good connector. So I really enjoyed uh, making the connections and working in international business is, is complicated. And, um, you know, even when you're working with within your own company, being a connector is just such a critical role and it um, facilitates getting so much more done. So I found myself connecting, you know, internally with my team externally for the customer and just making it just making work so much easier uh, to be able to be accomplished. So those are a couple things. Um, you asked for three. Uh, and let's see. Um, I would also say um, that, uh, you know, the other thing is pursue, I guess this is more about just from, from my standpoint, pursue what it is that gives you energy and what you're passionate about. And so I have found uh, a lot of times that I will be asked, uh, you know, what is the path? What is the path that you have taken? But, you know, that that's my specific path. I, I have found that I get the most joy and have the most energy and have been the most successful pursuing the things that get me really excited about coming to work. I feel like you naturally just give more because it gets you excited. And I really enjoy working in international business. I love learning, meeting new people and customers. I love being that connector. And um, so I encourage folks to, to pursue what they're energized and, and passionate about because it shines through in what they do and people look for that energy. So I, I guess those are my three things. They're kind of random, but. Not at all. Um, Patricia, what about you? Uh, yes, I think that the best lessons that I have learned on international, having done business with 40 countries and having brought U.S. companies to all of those countries, is the fact of how little the international company you're doing business with and the U.S. company may know about, again, the culture and the differences of the culture of doing business overseas and the overseas company doing business with the U.S. company. So what I take out and the best, the best thing that can happen is how do you navigate all of those differences? And how do you bring those two companies to realize that the business is going to be good for everybody, not only for one side, not only for the other side, but bring both companies together in which they can navigate their differences and make it one solid goal of doing business with each other. I think international is very exciting business. It is very complicated and at certain times and understanding the loss, understanding the cultures, understanding the, the company's cultures in, uh, in itself, understanding what one needs and the other one needs and bring them together. I believe that that is the best uh, the best uh, uh, part of doing business international on, on my experience. I believe that when you do it in an earnest way and wanting the best for each side, you bring companies together, you bring business together, and you bring success for everybody. Okay. Fantastic. And Carol? Um, yeah, so I would say the three things that 
that we've really taken away from the journey in the last year is, you know, echoing what Regina and Patricia said, you know, one, don't be afraid to say yes. Um, don't be afraid to to jump out and try something new and try something different. Sometimes lands you in a really unexpected place. Um, but that's been our whole journey, whether it was two soccer moms starting a food company with no experience at all to deciding to dive into this exciting international export world. Um, don't be afraid to say yes. And then the second thing is don't be afraid to ask for help. There's so much help to be had in so many of the people that I see on the call right now are people that have helped us along the way. You know, again, whether it's the ISBDC or international attorneys, you know, at Baker and Drinker, um, you know, just reaching out and saying, hey, we're not sure what this means. And then the third thing I would echo is exactly what Regina said. We're not anything but ourselves. At the end of the day, we can't be anything but two soccer moms with not a lot of experience in the export world. And we're not pretending to be that when we go into the meeting. We're not pretending to be the expert on absolutely anything but making great tasting peanut butter. And so we've been able to have real honest conversations. In the past year, we've hosted trade delegations into our facility from the Middle East, from Japan. They're coming in and we're reaching out and getting cultural training from you know, some of the different groups in Indiana that offer help on how to host an international trade delegation. We were so inexperienced, but we were just ourselves and we shared that, hey, we're really new to exporting. We would really love to explore this market with you. We would really like to work with you but let's talk through some of these points that I don't know that we can fulfill and let's talk and, and get a greater understanding. And I think by being open and honest and just truly who we are um, and not pretending to be professional, we didn't get caught in looking like we didn't know what we are doing because quite frankly, we didn't and we still don't, um, but but we are that at the end of the day. So I guess those would be the three things that we kind of take away from from everything we do. <laughs> Great. Great tips from all three of you, or lessons learned, I should say. And we're going to move into tips now. So I'd like to start with Patricia. Um, but what tips would you offer about international business to everyone who's listening in today? I, I believe that the main point is to have a good business plan. Okay. Uh, an international business plan, as I said before, is going to look different than your domestic business plan. And I believe that to evaluate the markets, find which regions make sense to go into first, what kind of product are you offering? And obviously, evaluate your, pro uh, your product, evaluate the markets, and make sure that everything that you are going to offer is going to be translated into that culture. And there's many ways that to do that without really having to change much, right? But just having to uh, just uh, alter uh, a couple of things that you may already be doing and understand what and which country you would like to go first. Understand that if you are going into that one country, what does the region offer? Can you just bring the same type of uh, business into other uh, countries alongside the same region? And how do you take uh, advantage of the multilateral agreements without, within the region? How do you take advantage of going into one country and bringing all those exports and all those sales, if we're talking about sales, um, into the other countries without having to do a lot of investment on your side until that side of international has grown to the point which the company has has the finances to back up all the real major uh, changes. Um, uh, again, international is exciting. Yeah. And international is an incredibly good business for everybody that would like to do uh, uh, international. I think that uh, for international, you can sell just about everything, just like you do here. But how do you sell? How do you understand that culture? How do you understand the sales in that culture? How do you, again, evaluate, design, and execute your business plan. But to me, there is a formula that is set. It doesn't change much from country to country, from region to region, but yes, we must understand the country we go to, the region we go to, the, the product we're selling, the product they're buying, how they, the, uh, the, uh, the culture understands your product, how you're gonna do the branding if, if, it, if uh, branding entails, how you're gonna do 
all the incorporation of all those changes without having to do so much uh, on the forefront. Great, thank you. We definitely need to work on our business plans, it sounds like. <laughs> so Regina, let's hear from you. What tips would you offer? Uh, yeah, uh, I was I was listening and I was thinking all this, uh, everything Patricia said translates to um, when I am thinking about um, our current product portfolio and and products that we're developing now. So, um, I, you know, talking, I was I was mentioning that um, we've endeavored beyond diesel, looking at and um, in the space of hydrogen. So, you know, for uh, trains, for example, we supply hydrogen fuel cells for trains and um, beyond diesel solutions. And as we're thinking about uh, applicability and export to global markets, we're doing the same types of things that, you know, Patricia's talking about. We're studying the market, understanding uh, the needs, so the landscape, um, what what is going on within that specific uh, market and what can they need? And thinking about things like, um, so something uh, that didn't get mentioned, but I know it would be a consideration in the plan would be, are there any sort of funding opportunities? So when I think about like the US and in my space, infrastructure, the infrastructure bill matters to me, right? And so if I'm working with customers and they're looking at um, entering into a potential demonstration type product, there could be some federal funding that's available to help me with that project and, and offset some of that cost. And so in any you know export, if we're thinking outside of the US, there could be some opportunities or projects where you're thinking about uh, potential funding and dollars that could be available. But we're also doing the same thing, thinking about competition, the market landscape, uh, the competitive needs, and, and how do we apply our product to that specific market? Also have to think about, are there specific requirements that they have that may be different than our base product that may drive us to change our product to meet that market's needs? And are we able to do that? And if we are, what's the cost? And is it, you know, so there are trade-offs. Um, and it, it's uh, the, having that market plan in place and understanding the background and the landscape, that's super applicable. Um, and then from my defense standpoint, just to anything that we export, there are also a lot of export controls that go along with this, right? So I do, um, there's a lot of work. Uh, so some of the uh, early conversation about um, understanding regulations, there's a huge amount of pre-work that goes into even considering um, any sort of application that could be remotely considered defense. So um, just making sure that you know what type of classification of product you're also working with is uh, very um, important and where that can land. So I uh, agree with Patricia, just added a bit there. Okay. And Carol? Um, I would say the biggest tips that, that we learned were, um, one, it's a long sales cycle internationally. Everything that Patricia and that Regina are saying, it isn't, it isn't easy. The export compliance that has to go into place, making sure that the, for our product, the ingredients are allowed in that country. There aren't any label changes or requirements. So as, as much success as we're experiencing, as excited as we are about it, the sales cycle is a lot longer than it is domestically. You know, we're we're just now fulfilling our first contracts that we started negotiating a year ago. And so um, I would say be prepared for that sales cycle. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Over 90% of the world's economy happens outside the U.S. It opens up so many new markets for us. But on the flip side of that, it does take a lot longer to get through those get through those steps. Um, and then another tip I would say is I know um, Lindsay actually posted it right in the chat. Um, there is grant funding to help with your international marketing efforts, and it's through INSTEP um, through the IEDC. And there's some funding to help you with marketing, to help with your label compliance, to help with your website. And so I would definitely reach out to the ISBDC and the IEDC and start leaning on those resources because I can't I can't say enough. There is so much help out there. Um, and then I see Mark asked about a trade delegation. I would say the biggest tip is to reach out and get some help. We'd never hosted an international trade delegation before, but when people are flying from 
you know, the other side of the world to meet with you. They obviously have a sincere interest in doing business. So take the time to learn about those cultural niceties, you know, whether it's appropriate to give a gift, what type of gift to give, whether it's appropriate to serve food, whether the the culture has a preferred seating chart, you know, for where people see or if they want to shake hands or bow. These were all things that were very new to us. Again, we're two soccer moms. We had no experience in international business, but boy, did we meet the right people to get some crash courses. You know, for example, we hosted a trade delegation from Japan and the Japanese Cultural Society of Indiana gave us, you know, some help. They gave us some tips. They gave us a PowerPoint presentation that kind of explained what to expect, what, how we should dress, how we should greet people. All of those things were so very helpful um, and they made us feel very confident going into the meeting. So I would say do your research, you know, um, it's great, it's exciting, but there are definitely lots of moving pieces um, to go along with these international deals. Super, thank you. So we do have a question from one of our audience members. Um, is there anything, resources or connections that was or that you would have wished was offered to you to assist in your early stages of global trade efforts? Let's see, how about, let's jump in with Regina first. Um, so I, I would say I could totally relate to, um, some of the, like the cultural and business etiquette going straight from, so this is like super early when I first started in international business. Um, luckily I actually had, uh, I did some work at an, an international tier one supplier, uh, in the large automotive space. And so I kind of got some free learning, uh, when I was still in college, I guess. But building upon that, those the business etiquette and cultural classes, when you start traveling, uh, you don't, you just can't even anticipate how many nuances there are, including things like just, um, you know, um, normal hand gestures here and facial expressions. Um, if you kind of, if you just, like if you cross your legs and you show the bottom of your foot in some cultures, that's offensive, right? And just not knowing, I was brand new to such a large global company. Um, the, that kind of information on the front end, when you're meeting with international delegations, international companies is super helpful. and just makes you feel so much more at ease. I think that's one of the biggest uh, items like right at the front end. The other piece, I, I think, uh, uh, was mentioned early on as well. I don't I don't remember if Carol mentioned this one. I think so. Like in terms, understanding all the the nuances of the the terminology and what they mean and who pays and when. Like I needed a crash course in that right away. That was something I didn't get in depth information um, until I actually got into business and I had to take a separate course um, to make sure I understood all that because it's a huge deal, especially if something were to go wrong. Uh, you don't. You can't even anticipate how much cost could be incurred in terms of liability if you you manage the income terms the wrong way. So I think those two things for me. Thank you. Regina, what's an inco term? <laughs> Just in, in terms of like a, when you mentioned the types of uh, the the like X works FOB port, you know those types of terms in terms of shipping. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I think uh, Mark just gave you the thumbs up. So that's good, Regina. So Patricia, um, what are your thoughts around that question? Well, I'm more of a cut to the chase kind of person. So I get to business. I understand that it is very important how to how to say hello, how to dress, how to do all these things. But I believe that when when two cultures are coming together, it both cultures are expecting to have those differences and what they both know also is that you have to be kind at all times that's the number one just be responsible be be respectful right but i believe that when you have people coming over or you're going out to another country the focus is on the business the focus is how are we going to get this um uh, to this to the next step 
So it is good to know about what the culture calls and, and what everybody uh, should be doing in, in that regard. But what they are expecting is for you to be very clear on the business culture itself, right? And what does that business culture entail? What, for example, um, if you are going to do business, and this happened to me in the last uh, in the last few months, if you are sending an NDA, right? How is that going to look in that other culture, right? Does the other culture understand that there will be an agreement for front in which you are trying to get business started and make them understand that the culture for both should be not only to respect each other's business, but also to protect each other's business. So the business culture, again, is very, very important. I understand, and that goes without saying, that to understand and be kind enough to not serve food to a, to a, a culture that doesn't need uh, meat, or to understand how to not show, like Regina was saying, the bottom of your uh, of your shoes is very important. But I believe that all in all, every group that I have done business with, every country that I have done business with, and every company I have helped bring internationally, we have all been focused mainly on what that business culture is, understand the business culture, and everything else is going to come into place. Great, thank you. And Carol, what about you? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, so when it comes to resources or connections that, you know, were or I wish were offered to me, I would say, you know, first and foremost, as I've discussed several times, the Export Accelerator was a huge resource for us. Um, it did walk us through that plan that Patricia alluded to earlier, where we kind of targeted in on our top 10 markets, areas that we really wanted to focus on. That was a huge resource that we took advantage of, and it was nice to help us formulate our early, you know, export endeavors where we thought would be a good market for our product and it was really broken down. Um, the other thing is we joined some professional trade associations specific to our industry that also offered some export resources and they put you in touch with, you know, um, market reps in other countries that can help you get an idea of how your product is going to fit there. So we worked with the American American Peanut Council the National Peanut Board, and then Food Export. Food Export Midwest is a huge, you know, if you're exporting food, they have a ton of resources to really help you target in on your area, and they'll help you talk to someone in the country that you want to do business with and figure out what is it that you need? What are the compliance things you need? What, what stores make sense? What marketing plan makes sense to kind of help you move through those pieces? So I think we got access to a lot of resources or connections, so I don't know if there's anything that that I was missing other than obviously all small businesses want more funding. Um, but but with Instep again, they were able to you know help us cover almost 50% of our marketing budget for those early food export shows, and that was a big big help because it allowed us to really get our brand out there and in front of international buyers. Super, thanks so much. So we are starting to run out of time. So any last questions from anyone in the audience, definitely feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and while we wait for that, I am going to ask a question. Okay, sorry. Wanted to make sure it wasn't a question before I asked mine. Um, I am curious, um, what advice would you offer to um, young women who are just at the beginning part of their careers about international business? And then I guess I need to pick someone to answer the question, don't I? So um, let's start with Patricia on that one. Well, I think that uh, international has an incredible uh, potential for uh, for young women and women in general. Uh, I believe that just like here in the United States, I believe that when you go internationally, you've got to be prepared. You have to know your business. You have to know how you want to proceed in that business. 
and be serious about your business. So it's no different than, than here in the United States. I believe that when you are uh, a responsible business, uh, an entrepreneur, um, or you work for a company, you wanna represent it well, you want to be serious about it, you want to know what you're doing, you wanna know uh, what your goal is and, uh, and be, a, uh, be truthful, first of all, make sure that you uh, open up as to you know what the real goal of your visit is or your business is, and uh, I don't believe that uh, internationally is so much different. Of course, if you have to choose the region as well. If you go to uh, the Middle East, I remember having to go to the Middle East, and they would have me come through not the lobby but through the back door. So so know the country, know the country where you're going. Make sure that you apply your knowledge to to uh, the country that you're visiting and doing business with. But my experience all throughout uh, uh, my international business career has been incredibly successful, incredibly uh, 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 good, uh, and and I never had any problems. So I don't I don't look at the at the at the world as uh, being being. Uh, an entrepreneur for one or from a woman, a man, or 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 uh, uh, the difference between doing business uh, being a woman. I think that uh, there is a lot of potential, and I think that you know we have our place internationally. So go for it. Be serious about your business, uh, and uh, and do business as you would here in the United States. Regina, what about you? I so I I would say um, you know I this is something where um, being going confidently forward with what you're interested in and really understanding you know the environment the market the product that you have and um, you know I as I said earlier I mean I I think that um, you know being yourself. And uh, just putting your best foot forward. I mean, this is a, a, a big, uh, it, it's a it's a big step, right? To take something internationally, um, it's a little bit different from you know, like where I have spent all of my career in a very large company. We have a established product, and so it's a little bit different. And so um, the stories that I shared about, you know, encountering all the the different. Um, cultures. I mean, that's it's just uh, in a very different market, and I I would say that there are times when um, you know it's maybe been a little bit you know uh, there there's a lot it can be a little bit overwhelming, and so being confident and um, you know going forward with uh, your product and um, you know working with your team, it's I mean that's super important, and so. It's a it's a little bit different in that I don't always have to establish the the product. I think some of it is much more interpersonal and relationship oriented. And um, I I would say investing a lot in personal relationships is one of the things that I think is very important. So when you do get that opportunity and you meet people, establish those relationships. Follow up with those people. Take the time to actually, you know, spend a bit more and and get to know who they are. When you say you're going to do something um, and commit to a follow up or an action item, see it through. It means a lot to people just to hear back that you heard what what you what they said and you followed through with what they asked you to do. And I think that's very meaningful to you know to stick to what you've said you would do. So. Um, you know, the, those personal relationships to me in terms of establishing that with the account teams or the other my counterparts that I'm working with, it's just super important and the follow through and the open communication is is critical. So that relationship element can't be underestimated in my mind. Great, thank you. And Carol? You know, as a woman who's new to export, I was just excited to hear the advice from from Regina and and Patricia. I mean, we are very new to this and we're still learning. And so I can just say, you know, we've done what Regina said, we're out there and we're just being ourselves. And and I think that that's that's the best that you can do. Be respectful, 
do your homework, and then above all, just be yourself and, and people will respond to that. Great, thank you. So we have one last question. Um, do any of you work with investors in your industry or is everything streamlined through banks? Um, so as someone who's new to export, I can I can definitely share a resource that we're using um, for export is XM Bank. XM Bank is the International Import Export Bank of the United States, and they've got some great resources to help you with funding on your um, cost of goods, funding to to fulfill a PO all the way to insurance as things are leaving the U.S. and arriving there. It's something I think a lot of small businesses um, could benefit from finding out a little bit more about what XM Bank does. They've been a great resource for us. All right, super. Thank you so much. So we are unfortunately at 1 p.m., which is the end of our, our webinar. But thank you so very, very much to our three amazing panelists. You had so many great um, words of wisdom and advice. It was truly an inspiring hour. So thank you so much to the three of you. And then also thank you so much to all of our sponsors and then to all of you who took the time to join us today. Andy, did I miss anything in March? Nope. Uh, I'd like to join uh, uh, Mark Hooper in, in offering our gratitude uh, to, to Leslie and Emily uh, for participating and certainly our speakers, uh, Patricia, Regina, and Carol for giving uh, and inspiring stories of, of your involvement in international trade. Um, I do, I would like to remember, remind everyone that uh, the resources that were mentioned throughout today's program from Export Import Bank to the SPA's Export Working Capital to the program, the Export Indiana uh, Accelerator Program, all of those links and all those resources can be found on our District Export Council's website, indianadec.org. And I provided a link also to our future events, uh, webinars that are coming up and programs. Uh, July 21 will be the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the anti-boycott provision uh, by Fager Drinker law firm, Joanne Akalunu and Matthew Levy from uh, Fager Drinker will present on that. September 15th is the Export Opportunities with India and the Indiana India Business Council, another partner to the deck will be presenting on September 15th. October 20th, we'll be doing uh, doing business in Africa seminar. It'll be an in-person event from 11.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Hotel Carmichael in, in, in Carmel. Uh, we'll be providing more information on those events as time goes forward. But again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, uh, Mark Cooper, uh, for your continued partnership. Mark, do you have any parting words? Just one thing, uh, I want to say thank you to our panelists, our speakers. It's been an exciting hour. I just want to make one mention of thank you, Jessica Garcia from Congressman Carson's office for joining us uh, on the seminar today and the webinar. We appreciate uh, your being here and uh, we, we thank you for your support. Thank you to everyone. It's been a great day and we will see you at our next event. Andy has uh, given you the schedule and we're excited and we want to do, we want to hear from you. Please tell us what you'd like to hear more of. I think that would be our closing comment. What what type of content it will help you succeed globally? That's what our objective is in putting on these programs. We worked yeah. together as, as partners to say what does the export community need and want to hear more of. Please let us know. Uh, contact us, and we'd be delighted to uh, listen to those suggestions. Thank you very much for this program today. Well said, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.